After dominating the Serie A for nine years, Juventus are now aiming to win a record 10th Scudetto, this time around. In the last nine years, the old lady has been the standard bearer for Italian football and has proudly represented Italy in the Champions League. After a tumultuous period where the Calcio Poli scandal saw them relegated to Serie B, Juventus slowly started building from the ground up. A lot of mistakes were made, ranging from bringing in the wrong players and showing minimum patience with managers, but eventually they managed to find the right man who would lead them in the shape of Antonio Conte. The former midfielder's arrival coincided with the signing of Andrea Pirlo, who many thought was done once he left AC Milan. However, the elegant midfielder had a lot left to give and guided the Bianconeri to several Serie A titles. Things have a way of coming full circle, don't they? Once it became clear that Maurizio Sarri was not going to help the team win their first Champions League title in eons, the former Napoli and Chelsea manager was fired. In his place, Andrea Pirlo was surprisingly promoted to the first team manager. Without boasting any football management experience, the former Italy international was given the task of ensuring that Juventus start playing attractive football while dominating on the domestic and continental front. But so far, it's becoming clear that Pirlo might not be the answer to Juventus' aspirations. The Italians want to become a global force, both on and off the field. That was why Pirlo was brought in back to the club. His legendary status and massive following makes him a highly marketable manager, just like Zinedine Zidane at Real Madrid. However, one major thing that Pirlo seems to lack is experience. Zidane was an assistant to Carlo Ancelotti before replacing the Italian at Real Madrid. Before that, he spent time working with the club's youth teams, which was a necessary part of his development as a manager. Pirlo, on the other hand, never got a chance to do all that. In fact, he was just made the head coach of the academy side before he was told that he'd be replacing Sarri at the helm. Regardless of what Fabio Paratici and company say, Pirlo must have been taken aback by such a quick promotion. But as Juventus continued to struggle domestically, it's evident that the club's decision-makers might have thrust a lot of responsibility on Pirlo way too soon. The 2020-21 Serie A campaign has not started on a very positive note. Juventus have struggled to get results. They were very lucky to have taken a point from the 2 all draw with Roma. Had Paolo Fonseca's men been more composed in front of goal, Juventus would have lost the game by a decent margin. The game against Crotone was supposed to be a walk in the park. The newly promoted side was never supposed to offer them any resistance, but a one all draw exposed a lot of issues in this Juventus side, and most recently, they were again held to a one all draw by Hellas Verona. If we look at these results, it seems very surprising because Juventus would have easily defeated these teams in the previous season. This season, however, they're struggling to hold their own against pretty much every team. Once they're done with the Barcelona game, Juve will take on Spezia, in a game Pirlo will be expected to win. However, simply winning might not be enough. The club's senior management expects their team to win and do so in style. The reason why Massimiliano Allegri was not forced into staying at the club was because of the rather constricted type of football he was making the players play. Similarly, Sarri's footballing philosophy didn't make any heads turn either. The opening game of the season against Sampdoria was a comfortable 3-0 win. Pirlo decided to change Juventus' formation and turned it into a 3-5-2, which often morphed into a 3-4-1-2 during the game. Pirlo decided to go for a three-man defence while young Gianluca Frabotta was positioned down the left flank to replace the injured Alexandro. Surprisingly, Rodrigo Bentancur, who led the assists board for his team last season, started from the bench. Adrian Rabio and Weston McKennie started in the middle of the park, while Aaron Ramsey was placed in a more advanced position in order to give the Welshman freedom to roam. Without being able to rely on an injured Paolo Dybala, Dejan Kulusevski started alongside Cristiano Ronaldo. Throughout the game, Juve dominated proceedings and the wingers ensured quick side changes which further stretched Sampdoria's defence. Indeed, Juve were looking like a team that would attack in numbers and with quick transitions would look to make life difficult for their opponents. By the end of the game, it became clear that Pirlo was going to make the team play a much more expansive brand of football, in stark contrast to the one that was on display in the last few years. Despite not being able to count on the likes of Dybala, Matej de Ligt and Sandro, Juventus pulled off a very convincing win and even put in a great defensive display. The team was very mobile, the passing was crisp, no one took a lot of time on the ball while the team chemistry showed that this team would only get better from there. Playing a 3-5-2 formation meant that Juventus were going to bring back some really exciting football to the Serie A. However, as it turned out, the opening game was more of a false dawn. The game against Roma was going to be the team's, and in particular, Andrea Pirlo's first test. We all thought that against Roma, they would be using the same tactics that worked out so well against Sampdoria, 
However, Pirlo decided to set up his team in order to counter the Giallo Rossi's intense pressing. Paolo Fonseca's men were building from the back and never gave their opponents enough time on the ball. It does appear that Pirlo isn't certain of his best starting eleven or the formation, but credit where it's due, the former Italy international went for a conservative formation knowing that Roma would look to attack. And in order to neutralize the creative influence of the likes of Pedro, Mkhitaryan, and the physical presence of Dzeko, the likes of Rabiot and McKennie were seen dropping deeper in their own half and helping out the defense. Moreover, with the likes of Danilo and Quadrado positioned closer to Chiellini and Bonucci, it was clear that Juventus wanted to defend in numbers against a Roma side that had a lot of pace on the break. Andrea Pirlo is still testing things out, but it's abundantly clear that Juventus do have some issues in defense. While Quadrado is great going forward, the Colombian's inability to show more awareness when it comes to defending is a real problem. Danilo's form seems to be unlike the one that we witnessed last season, with the Brazilian being caught out of position and beaten for pace quite a lot. Similarly, Juventus's defensive pairing of Chiellini and Bonucci does seem to be overworked, with the veterans not as solid as they've been for the good part of 10 years. They did struggle quite a bit, and perhaps it's time to bank more on young defenders such as Merich Demiral and Matej de Ligt. The team's attacking play isn't as smooth and quick as it should be, and this is something that's really going to affect them when they come up against teams that defend in numbers and sit deep. Pirlo's Juventus was always going to look a little different from the old lady of yesteryears but there are definitely a lot of glaring issues that need to be addressed. Weston McKennie has already been thrown in at the deep end, and while the young American is full of enthusiasm, he's going to take his time to fill the void left by Blaise Matuidi. And now that Chiellini's out injured, Juventus really have some defensive headaches to contend with. Marich Demiral was given a rare start, and the young Turkish defender did fairly well. However, the team can't wait to welcome back De Ligt whose pace and ability to pass out from the back is going to play a crucial role in allowing Pirlo into making the team play the sort of free-flowing football he promised when he was appointed. The manner in which Juventus played the game was a little surprising, in the sense that both teams were well-matched for most parts of the 90-minute affair. Verona deserved all the plaudits for holding onto a draw and their overall approach towards the game. While out of possession, Juventus appeared to be too methodical and rigid in their shape. Verona, on the other hand, were more fluid and even imaginative, not worried about the fact that they were playing against a far more superior side that could punish them on the break. Juve's pressing was too coordinated in contrast to a combative approach Verona adopted. Interestingly, Verona have proven to be Bianconeri's bogey team in the past year. Last season, they won against Hellas at home, but then lost the away game. Juventus did try to win the game. It's not as if they simply rolled over and allowed themselves to be run over by a team that just returned to top-flight Italian football last year. However, Pirlo's team did struggle to create any major breakthroughs. Things on the European front are looking a bit less bleak, though. Juventus started the Champions League campaign with a 2-0 win over Dinamo Kiev and both Federico Chiesa and Alvaro Morata showcasing their credentials against the Ukrainians. However, would Juve be able to repeat that display against Barcelona over the course of the two legs on the evidence of what they've done in the league? The jury's definitely out on the team, and more so on their manager, who at times has looked out of his depth ever since he was entrusted with a job at a club that wants to achieve global supremacy after falling short in Europe time and time again.